right, here we go. Yep. All right, did anyone log in yet? Anyone in? Anyone on the channel? Ooh, that's in. Muscle. All right. Anyone tuning in? Need someone to tune in. Hey, Rose Phoenix, how are you? Okay. <clears throat> hey. Hey, Minnie. Hey, Mystery Flower. Hey, Bean Boys. Okay, since you're here. Hey, Iban. Iban. Hey, Sam Sam. Uh, you know the drill. Uh, since you're here. Mic check, audio check. Video check. How's the audio? How's the video? Hey, V50, how are you? Uh, well, we're not all that good yet. Ooh, I didn't want to touch that one. Boom, there you go. You gotta have lighting. Yeah, you gotta have lighting. Hey, Saint Way. Good. Yeah. Okay, we got a minute left. I got a minute before we start. Uh, today's one of those really rare, rare, um, Streams in which I will be using slide decks. I mean, I usually don't use slide decks for uh, presentations. Hey, Crispy Nuggets. Hey, GD Rossi. How are you? How are you? Yeah, now we got. To... This is one of those. Um, yeah. So this is uh, going to be all hands on today, of course, as each and every Thursday is. Each and every Thursday is hands-on. Today is definitely a lot of fun. It's also dense, too. It's a very dense one today. Um, all hands-on next day. Hey, DD Band. Yeah. All right. 4.30. We need to use every uh, every minute that we have today. Hello, everyone. I'm Ming Chow, um, associate teaching professor. Uh, and welcome to Introduction to Security off at, at Tufts University. This is episode two, the second episode of season number seven. And uh, today is going to be one of my absolute favorite topics. Uh, one of my, it's absolutely one of my favorite topics and one I pay, pay homage to. Uh, today we're going to do and learn uh, packet analysis and using wire and using Wireshark. So we're going to do network traffic analysis or packet analysis using Wireshark. Uh, if you don't know already, that's my other email address. It's ming at wallasheep.com. And that's also Twitter handle. So a little start with a little motivation for you. Again, this is one of those really rare uh, episodes and streams where I actually use a slide deck for kind of good reasons. Here's a little motivation, a little motivation for you a little bit about the wall of sheep so the wall of sheep is a very very famous and also infamous um display at the world largest hacking and security conference defcon again defcon is the conference held in las vegas nevada each and every summer where parents tell their kids not to go to because everything gets broken into electronic devices get hacked that was certainly true back in the 2000s. It's less or so now. Uh, I don't see it that happen many times, but a lot of people love to see the wall of sheep because the wall of sheep has been around for a long time. Hey, Kaya, how are you? Hey, Bibbs, how are you? Hey, Bibbs. Yep, good to see you, man. Um, so, what the wall of sheep is, is a wall. Some people like to call it a wall of shame. Yeah, I usually roll my eyes when people say that. But the wall of sheep, what it is, is a list of all the usernames and passwords, password censored, the last, all the first three characters not censored, the last are censored, followed by the domain and IP and the protocol that was used to send the credential insecurely over arguably the world's most dangerous computer network. 
Uh, and the Wall of Sheep and the Packet Hacking Village for since, I don't know, way too long, almost 20 years, or if not over 20 years, have, have monitored the entire DEF CON conference computer network. The reason why it's so dangerous, the DEF CON network, is because it is used by attackers, good and bad. Um, law, now even you put law enforcement, government agencies, lawyers, journalists, you name it. You put all those people in one room, 30,000 plus, and you know that there's going to be a really, really interesting network. We don't see st uh, uh, stuff like Gmail, Twitter, um, Tumblr accounts anymore. We don't see that, but back in the days, yes, we did. Uh, because, you know, time has changed over the last 10 years. Believe it or not, some, somehow for the better. And now we're using secure protocols now to communicate uh, on the Internet. But uh, the wall of sheep, what it is, is it's not a wall of shame, but it's an educational opportunity to inform people this is what happens when you're using not weak username and password, but when you use when you're sending your credentials and other sensitive information insecurely on a network. So a little bit about the wall of sheep and the packet hacking village. Our mission is security awareness, and we do a lot of and we accomplished about that by uh, a lot of interactive demonstrations, unconventional methods. Um, back in the 2010, we ran a fundraiser for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, with that that was quote unquote a peekaboo booth. That was showing all the pictures that people were looking at on the DevCon network. Let you wildest imagination run through that one. But now we give a lot of trainings, uh, a lot of interactive training. Unfortunately, you do have to wait for a while, but all fun. Uh, we give Linux trainers, regex trainers, and we give packet analysis training as well too. And of course this is my, uh, you know, of course this is that time of the year. Uh, yeah, I miss the folks at the Wall of Sheep in the Packet Hacking Village. Yeah. I mean, I get to a point where everyone becomes family. So what is packet analysis? What is packet analysis? Packet analysis goes by a number of different names. The whole idea of packet analysis is look at an understanding computer network traffic. It goes by so many different names, including analyzing packet network traffic analysis, packet sniffing protocol analysis, and packet tracing. They're all the same. Now, you may actually notice that the word packet is in italics. So, of course, when you see a term that is in italics, I'm going to mention a little bit more about that in, later on in terms of terminology. Why? Why in the world do you want to do packet analysis? One friendly reminder and note is anything, any tool and technique in cybersecurity can be used for both good and bad, or good or bad, okay? It's a double-edged sword. Packet analysis is used to troubleshoot networking issues, um, used to record communications such as email, uh, voice, which is actually more common than you think, uh, to record and analyze web traffic, you know, when you're going web browsing. Uh, this again can be used for good and bad. I mean, yes, this is very much called eavesdropping. But it's also used for good if you want to make sure that the web traffic is encrypted and secure. Hey, flea bag. Uh, packet analysis is also used to reconstruct images and other data transmitted over a network. And last, to catch username, password, sensitive information, and other uh, that was sent insecurely in plain text on a network. Today, we're actually going to do um, actually all of these hands-on. So we're going to work with four, at least four sets of data. Yes, you're going to rip out username and password, identify username and password. And you're also going to reconstruct images and other files that were transmitted on a network. So in 2017, fall 2017, uh, a student who was taking this class brought, atten brought to my attention this article on a Wired magazine. I want to give a shout out to Garrett Graff who wrote this. And I remember that the joke that we like, I like to tell everyone is we almost started World War III on Twitter. 
uh, when this article came out because the wording was just so messed up. And the word in question were, quote, on the compromised devices, they had to carefully reconstruct the network traffic data and to study how the Mirai botnet code launched so-called packets against its targets. A little understood forensics process known as analyzing PCAP, packet capture data. Think of it as a digital equivalent of uh, testing for fingerprints or gunshot residue. It was the most complex DDoS software I've run across, Klein said, and this was just extremely weird wording. And today, the whole gist of today, the whole premise of today will be, I'm going to teach you and show you this quote-unquote little understood forensics process known as analyzing PCAP packet capture data. There is also a uh, joke in the cyber community, cybersecurity community, is that PCAPs or it didn't happen. So, what is a packet? Okay, uh, you're on Twitch right now. Everyone's on Twitch right now. Uh, everything that you do on a network, whether it's on this Twitch stream, whether it's on a Zoom call, whether it's downloading a web page, whether it is going to Netflix to stream, even playing video, playing your favorite network video game, network uh, game, uh, Diablo Four, uh, or um, uh, anyone playing what's that new one? That's Starfield, I think it is. Uh, Minecraft. Uh, yeah, especially even Minecraft. All of that, when you're doing those activities, it's everything is comprised of many, many, many packets. So right now, this Twitch stream is made up of thousands and thousands of packets, like hitting right now. When you're downloading a web page, uh, it is comprised of tens of dozens of network packets. A single network packet is just a unit of data. Uh, in general, in general, a single network packet, a single packet contains the following information. Source and destination IP addresses and ports. Actually, there's a mistake here. Actually, not every single network packet will contain ports. Every single network packet will contain source and destination IP address. That's for sure, but not necessarily ports. Uh, each and every network packet or a MAC address, um, time to live, and protocol. Most network packets will have ports and data payload, like the piece of the email or the piece of the web page or the piece of the, uh, of the game data. A single network packet, a single packet encapsulates what is, uh, what is known as all the layers of the open system, in open systems interconnection model or the OSI model. And I really hate, and I want to give a shout out to my friend Rob Graham, because this is one topic that we don't like to talk about because it's confusing as hell, and also, quite frankly, a lot of it, some, some of it doesn't even make sense as well. But what is the OSI model? The OSI model is, quote unquote, a conceptual framework that describes the functions of a networking or telecommunication system. Again, all I tell people is the only thing that you really care about about the OSI model is know a couple of facts. Fact number one, there are seven layers. Fact number two is each and every layer is abstracted from each and every other, from the highest level of abstraction to the lowest level of abstraction. So layer seven at the very top is application layer. The application layer is things that you use and love each and every day, like email, web, um, streaming on Twitch, okay? And then, of course, that's all you care about. You only care about, you know, sending out an email, but you don't care about things like delivery reliability and the bits and the hardware and the air and the uh, and the presentation. You just need to make sure that you're downloading a web page or you're just sending an email correctly or you're, um, you know, and it gets to point A to point B. It's all you care about. So each and every layer has a different responsibility. The ones that we really care about that we're going to actually look and analyze, you know, throughout this whole course will be namely um, the transport layer at layer four and the network layer at layer three. We'll also cover a little, we'll talk a little bit about layer two as well, too. But uh, think of it this way. If you're familiar with the uh, postal inspection of with post office, how you, when you're mailing a letter, you know, 
there's a certain format. When you're mailing a letter, the envelope has, has a source and destination address. The source and destination. Layer 3, the only thing that Layer 3 is really responsible for, the network layer, is the source and destination IP address. It does not have any concept of uh, payload or port numbers or any of that stuff. That's in Layer 4. So the transport uh, transmission control protocol, which is known as TCP, has the ideas of port numbers and the data payload, like the piece of data from your email or whatever. Now that's why it's so common that you hear the term TCP IP thrown around and used, because they both have to go, they both work together. So TCP has the port number and the payload, the IP, which is part of layer three, the internet protocol, part of layer three, source and destination IP addresses. Here's another illustration of the OSI model, and you can see the breakdown of what happens when you're just, well, doing things like going to Google or being on this Twitch stream. You can see highest level of abstraction to the lowest level of abstraction, all the way down, okay? Yeah, and uh, yeah, path, uh, path determination and logical addressing is layer, layer three, but transport layer four is end-to-end -end connection and reliability. You know, without layer four, yeah, it's good that you have a source and destination address, but where the hell do you go? Physical addressing, MAC address layer two, and then the wires, air, silicon bits on the physical layer. I like to use this, um, this picture a lot. Is two Reddit users trying to talk to each other. So when one Reddit user is trying to send a message to another Reddit user, it'll go application layer. Here's a Reddit user at the top, application layer, the transport layer, transport layer, internet layer, internet layer, the link layer, link layer, the physical layer. Told you no one cares about layer six and five. Link layer, the physical layer, physical layer. Now we're going to work up the chain again. Link layer, physical layer, the link layer, link layer, the internet layer, internet layer, the transport layer, transport layer, the application layer, application layer, the Reddit user. And then the Reddit user gets a message. Okay, so all you can, all you need to know are seven layers, each and every layer abstracted away from each and uh, from from each and every other layer. Each and every each layer has a different responsibility. Okay, so what is a PCAP file? I already I already said the joke. PCAPs or it didn't happen. A packet a PCAP file is just really just a file type. It's a file extension. PCAP stands for packet capture. Uh, PCAP, dot .pcap is a common file extension uh, for packet captures and is commonly used in applications such as Wireshark. Just to give you an idea, a single 100 megabyte PCAP file contains tens of thousands of packets. Okay, so a PCAP file is just packet capture, it's a file type. So what is Wireshark? Okay, so Wireshark is a graphical an extensive packet analyzer. Uh, it's an open source tool, it's a free tool, it's also platform independent, uh, available for all operating systems, Windows, Mac OS, Linux. You can do things, so many good stuff like features such as uh, filtering, reconstructing conversation, reconstructing files based on packet. You just go to download uh, Wireshark on y and Wireshark.org. Uh, Wireshark is arguably the most important tool for any cybersecurity practitioner who is dealing with networks. Uh, it's also arguably people all, even in cybersecurity as a field, not just networking, but even a network, uh, cybersecurity people say that Wireshark is just way up there, if definitely one of the top three most important tools in cybersecurity. So we're gonna be using Wireshark extensively today. So we've covered what a packet is, what a PCAP file is, what Wireshark is. So here's the Wireshark interface. This is a little old. Uh, there's a little minor, minor change uh, in the in modern Wireshark interface. There's a toolbar. There is uh, for filtering. Then there is a packet list pane, which is a list of all the packets in a table format, rows. Then you have a packet details. When you click on one of the rows or one of the packets, you can see the breakdown of all the layers uh, for the packet in the packet list pane. And then at the last but not least is the packet bytes pane. A single network packet is in binary. It's binary data, so packet bytes. So you can see actually the actual binary of the, uh, of the packet. 
So uh, all these, uh, what we're now going to do is we're going to get into exercises, hands-on exercises. All the PCAPs that we're going to use are available on this uh, GitHub that I have. It's github.com slash mchow01 slash bootcamp. Um, there is actually just a little warning for each and every one of you. This, this repository also has real malware. Uh, don't worry about it. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with the, here we go, exercise number one. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to open a Firefox. Why am I opening a Firefox? Well, there's a reason for that. Go to github.com slash mchow01 and bootcamp. And here in this repository, there are one, two, three, four, five, six different PCAPs. Okay, and we're going to actually, for today, we're going to use one, two, three, we're going to go to at least four of them. So the first PCAP is set one dot PCAP, 715 bytes. Now I'm going to send you the, oh, I'm going to, I don't need it because I have a local copy. I'm going to copy link and I'm going to paste it on the chat to everyone. There you go. And everyone will go down, it's 715 bytes. So now, it's very small. But can you all see my terminal? If you can see my terminal now, I'm going to go to my home directory. I'm going to go to documents. I'm going to go to boot camp. This is my local copy of all the P caption file. Now I'm going to go to ls minus l. And you notice that set one dot pcap is 715 bytes. Really, really small. I'm going to clear my screen right now. So if I try to open up set1.pcap on the terminal, if I open up set1.pcap on the terminal, this is what happens. So I'm going to do cat set1.pcap. Watch what happens. You notice something? Looks really, really weird. First of all, it's all gobbledygook characters. And then you hear a couple beeps at the end. This looks like this looks really ugly. The reason why I'm doing this is to show you how a when you try to open up a PCAP file or try to view a PCAP file in a terminal, it's all binary. It's all binary data. Now, this is again, this is a very small PCAP file. Let's open up Wireshark now. There it is. And Wireshark. And now, let me open up set1.pcap, and you will notice the difference. Here's the terminal. I'm going to file open. Set1.pcap, 715 bytes. Ta-da! Welcome. Here you go, folks. Welcome to Wireshark. Here's a toolbar. Here's a list of all the packets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight packets. Here's a drill down pane. And here's the binary data of the packet. Yeah. There. So let's do a few exercises. Open up a simple PCAP file in Wireshark, which we did. Okay, question one, how many packets are there? Question number two is what networking protocol is used? Question number three, what is the source? IP address. Question number four is what is a destination IP address? And question number five is what port is the source using to communicate with the destination? Or what port number is the destination listening on? Let's go back to Wireshark. Does anyone notice something? Okay, let me do the very most simplest one. How many packets are there? Count the number of rows. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight rows, I mean there are eight packets. And you notice that each and every time when I change the change the packet or highlight a different packet, the binary data changes and also the drill down changes. Okay, so I want someone to observe something. Does anyone notice something very, very observe something with the first three packets? I want someone to chime in. Does anyone notice something with the first three packets? I hope this stream is actually alive, that people are listening in. Hello, anyone? 
Please tell me you're out there. Someone write in the chat. This chat is dead. This chat is dead, yo. Okay, Mystery Flower says two IP addresses. That is absolutely correct. So, Mystery underscore Flower actually mentioned something very of something observant. There are only two IP addresses, which is kind of nice. It's nice and simple to deal with. There's only two IP addresses, as you can see, the source and destination. 192.168.1.3 and 192.168.1.8. There's only two IP addresses. But which one is the which one is the source and which one is the destination? Now, DD band sent a sync act, but you notice Balo uh, Balow time. You see the first three packets. You see sync, sync act, and act. This is a TCP three way handshake, folks. Yeah. So now you can see the TCP three way handshake. Sync, sync act, and act. You can see the TCB three-way handshake. Yeah. And of course, someone's going to end the conversation and say, Finn. So yeah, the handshake is a very, very important thing to know and to observe. And you notice that the protocol that is used for each and every single packet is TCP. So, we know what protocol is being used here, which is TCP. We know the two different IP addresses, but which one is the source and which one is the destination? Well, you notice the you notice the TCP three way handshake. So that's a huge, huge uh, hint right there. But look at the info. I did mention one of the questions with the port numbers. Yeah, I get that all the time. Easy. I, I, yeah, I'm I'm glad you asked. Why is shark? This is one thing I just don't know off the top of my head. What in the world are EC and CWR? There it is. This is where you have to do something or look the damn thing up. Oh man, I don't find a good. CWR and acknowledgement. Oh, ACK stands for what? Acknowledge? I think that's what it is. Uh, EC, what is it? ECN and CW are related to bandwidth conjunction. Yeah, uh, 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 bandwidth. To support ECN. Yeah. Uh, honestly, it's like I never understand. Like CW, ECE. It's just this is one of those things I don't, I never remember off the top of my head. I just look it up. Yeah, I can roll Phoenix. I guess why does it end with ACK? Yeah, I said earlier, you know, ACK means acknowledge. Well, if you want the full, finer details of um, ACK. Oh, but why is the last packet? Oh, 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 this one, ACK. Good question. Good question. Why does it end with the ACK? Oh, that, 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 that. Why does it end with this one? That's a good question. All right, we'll get to what this RST and ACK means. Uh, ACK, okay, ACK means that the machine sending the packet with ACK is acknowledging, acknowledging that the data it had received from the other machine. In TCP, I'm gonna blow this up. In TCP, once the connection is established, all packets sent by either side will consider and contain an ACK. Re-acknowledge, I guess what it is, like when you say goodbye, it also means, which is Finn, that means, yep, roger that. I think that's the reason why. Okay, I guess that's what, what it means. So I, I hope I shed some insight, Rose, on why it ends in ACK. It's like, at eh, Roger that. Okay, it means Roger that. Ah, eh, goodbye. Yep, yeah, goodbye. Something like that. Um, One information, one bit of information that I did not mention is the port numbers. Here is in the info column. So that's actually a good question, Rose, is that, I, you know, we always have to look that up. But I believe, I'm pretty sure the reason why the last packet, the last packet is ACK, just to say, hey, roger that. Yeah. Um, 
port numbers. These numbers separated by an arrow, a right arrow, are actually port numbers. So 192.168.1.3 at port 49859 is sending to 192.168.1.8 a SYN to port 7777 at 192.168.1.8. And then in the sync gag is 192.168.1.8 at port 7777 uh, is sending in sync gag to 192.168.1.3 at 49859 port yet. Yeah. So the destination port number of the server in this case is 192.168.1.8 at port 7777. If you're wondering why I use 7777 all the time, because port 7777 four sevens is used for nefarious purposes often. Mm -hmm. But let's do a further drill down. Let's go to select the first packet, packet number one, and you can see the MAC address, the destination MAC address. Notice when I actually highlight the destination. Uh, uh, when I highlight a certain field in the drill down, you can see where that data is uh, in hex. Uh, the bytes in the binary that is on the right here. So the destination MAC address, source MAC address. You may also notice you can, the, the MAC addresses also can um, tell who's a vendor of the device. Uh, a B827EB uh, is uh, belongs to Raspberry Pi, and Apple Land is A45E60. Yeah. So my source is an app. The source in this case, 192.168.1.3, is an Apple device. A Raspberry Pi is the destination. Okay. Then you can take a look at the IP address, IPv4. Now you notice this is very, very important to know. These are the different fields of IPv4. This is layer three of the OSI of the OSI model, the network layer. You see the protocol, and you all, the most important thing is source IP address, destination IP address. But you notice the IP source and destination is uh, source and destination in uh, Mirage is the source and destination IP addresses. Okay, the source is your client, and in this case is my Mac, uh, in this case is my uh, MacBook Pro, or my Apple device. And the destination is the client, who is my Mac actually communicating to. So I'm talking to some Raspberry Pi. Uh, the destination could be like anything, like a remote server, it could be an Xbox, a Microsoft device, you name, you name it. So the destination is a 192.168.1.8. But you notice that in the IP, IP uh, Internet Protocol version 4, there's no concept of ports. There's no concept of data payloads. Those are all in the Transmission Control Protocol, TCP. What TCP has, this is now layer 4. TCP is on layer 4 of the OSI model. There's no concept of uh, IP addresses, but there is a concept of source port, destination port, and other fields such as TCP flags. There it is. Window checksum, pointer, timestamps. Uh, usually the most of like, you know, uh, I tell people if you're working with TCP for the first time, the most important stuff that you really want to know are the flags, the data payload if it exists, the source port, and the destination port. Yeah. So yeah, in this case, we have a, my, you, can, you can see that I'm using an Apple device talking to a Raspberry Pi server at port 7777. Yeah. So now, welcome to Wireshark. Yeah. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. Let me scroll down. There's very few human readable text here. So you may be wondering. How do you reconstruct a conversation in Wireshark? How can you reconstruct a conversation? How do you know like a conversation could be like a file, a message, or whatever? 
How you reconstruct a conversation between two parties in Wireshark is the following. All you need to do is, in step number one, click on a packet. Step number two, right click on the packet. Then go to follow, and then follow one of the following TC streams, depending on protocol. TCP stream is the most common. Go here. What you do is, I just in this case, just highlight any, I don't care which package is. Let's say the fifth one. Right click on it, right click, go to follow, go to TCP. So what's going to happen next is you're going to see the message that 192.168.1.3 sent to 192.168.1.8 at port 7777. What? Me worry. Yeah, that's it. That's it. The only message. 15 bytes shown in ASCII text. Yep, this is the TCP string. Now, if there's more than one content, such as file or picture or whatever, that is sent, transmitted from point A to point B, you can actually take a look at the uh, uh, other files and data by clicking on streams. Stream is always going to start at zero. And if there's more than one, you should be able to go up and down. This is the only stream. This is the only data that was sent between 192, 192.168.1.3 and 192.168.1.8. There's nothing else. What you can also do is, in some, a lot of cases, you can do a save as. You can even save the content to, the, to, a, uh, to your computer and for further analysis. Just a warning for you, when you're saving data such as images and PDF, uh, PDFs, PCAPs, you don't want to save the data as ASCII. You want to save the data as raw binary. Save it as. Because if you save it as ASCII, such as this, it's going to be, you know, you're just going to get text. It was no good. No bueno. Okay. Are we ready for the next one? So let's do an example of, okay. I think uh, I want to give a shout out to Catherine. Uh, she asked about what's the difference between HTTP and HTTPS and VPN. There was at one time a website called Tufts.io. You could go to Tufts.io, it's no longer existent, but back in the days when it was around, you can go to Tufts.io by way of either HTTP or HTTPS. Now, I haven't checked uh, what Tufts.io looks like recently, but if you did, you let's get a uh, HTTP colon slash at Tufts.io. I think the site is dead. Yeah, it's for sale now. But I did have a copy of the site. So you may be wondering, what's the difference between HTTP and HTTPS? I mean, seriously, I mean, a lot of you folks know, or have, have heard that HTTP is, everything is in plain text unencrypted, while HTTPS, the content is encrypted. Like, even if you try to reconstruct a conversation or reconstruct all the files, you cannot. Now I'm going to show you the difference of what web traffic looks like when you go to HTTP versus HTTPS. And also using a VPN, a virtual private network, which will just cover everything, encrypt everything that you do, no matter what network, type of network you are on. Okay? So I'm going to go to Wireshark. I'm going to open, oh, before I do that, I'm going to clear out the filter. I'm going to do an open. And I'm going to go to tufts.io-insecure.pcap. Tufts 233 kilobytes around. There you go. How many packets are here? 347. All right, so how do I reconstruct? You notice, here's a sign. A signal is a lot of unencrypted content, especially HTTP, is in green. When you see green or HTTP, that means you can reconstruct the conversation. Right click on an HTTP packet. Right click follow. Now you're going to have one or two options. TCP stream or HTTP stream. TCP stream is good, but the most you go with the more generic or with the more specific one. HTTP stream. I'm going to show you TCP stream for now. And you can see the HTTP headers of the website. The HTTP uh, request and response headers, picture date, perhaps even picture data, all that stuff. Not good. Can I go up a stream? Oh, yeah. More. 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 
quite a lot of data that makes up Tufts I.O. I'm going to close this now. Go back to the, yeah, where I was. Now I'm going to follow HTTP stream. And there you go. Yeah, this is the entire website. You can see, yep. You can see CSS file, contact uh, tasking style sheet. And you can reconstruct it all. Here's another dirty trick I want to let you all know. If you see HTTP content, now right now, just to let you all know, there is nothing on my desktop. It's absolutely nothing on my desktop right now. We're going to need a terminal later. But if you actually, what you can do in Wireshark is if you want to dump all the plain text content or the insecure one, file, export objects, HTTP. Yeah. You're going to go to file, export objects, HTTP, and you can see all, like you can even, it will dump the favorite icon, picture, JS, uh, CSS file, JavaScript file, and just do a save all, save it to a desktop. Close. Yeah, you can. It can reconstruct all the web page files, JavaScript, PNG, CSS, your favorite icon, you name it. Yeah. Now see your desktop. All of this. RM star. Just blow everything away for now. Okay. So now this is tough style and secure. Let's open up Tufts IO secure.pcap. Now this is going to https colon slash slash tufts.io. There is green here. But as you will notice, these have nothing to do with the website. In fact, they're just Firefox content. I'm going to go right click follow TCP stream on this. You can see the host is at Firefox. This has nothing to do with Tufts IO. Nothing to do with Tufts I.O. Nothing to do with Tufts I.O. I see all this stuff here. A lot of gobbledygook. Type kit. Yeah. So now, even if I do... Where was I? Right click on this, follow HTTP stream on this. Add detect portal.firefox.com. No, success, that's it. No, no data pertaining to tufts.io. Tufts so if I do a file, export objects, HTTP now on tufts.io-secure.pcap, you have digit like certificate information when you're going to HTTPS site. You don't get favorite icons and all that stuff associated with Tufts.io. Do one more, which is, what happened if I go to Tufts.io on a VPN, a virtual private network? It's even worse, you can't make anything out of it. Everything's encrypted. Got a file, right click follow UDP stream, and it's like bleh. Yuck. Nothing. So the moral of the story really is, the real moral of the story, you always want to be using encrypted services. Use encryption or encrypted services. There it is. All right, let's do second exercise. This time we're going to use extracting pictures. Set 2.pcap. So the question is, are what insecure protocol was used to transmit pictures on the network, how many pictures were transmitted, and extract one of the pictures that was transmitted. The hint is, and I said this before, show and save the picture as raw format. Okay. So, hey. Uh, 
copy link. Paste it on the chat. Bang. That's for you, folks. It's all for you. All right. Set to the PCAP. Pretty small. 390 kilobytes. 391 kilobytes. There we go. There you go. How many packets are here? 482. Not bad. 482 packets. But I did say that there are pictures, right? Well, question is, what insecure protocol was used to transmit pictures on the network? Take a look. You see FTP, you see TCP, you see the TCP three-way handshake. So only again, this again in this case it should be only two IP addresses, 192.168.1.228 and 192.168.1.8. You see the TCP three-way handshake here, TCP, three-way handshake, and then you see FTP. FTP is the file transfer protocol. The file transfer protocol is an application protocol, layer 7 of the OSI model. Yes, a lot of the services that you know and love, such as FTP, HTTP, pop for email SSH, all use TCP. The file transfer protocol is used to transfer files. Ah, Rose Phoenix, you asked a fantastic question. What's the difference between FTP and FTP data? There is a tiny difference, but they go together. FTP, when you see FTP data, that is the data that gets sent to an FTP server. So FTP data will usually be, let's say, the piece of the picture that got sent to the server. FTP is generally just a, a log. What the hell does that mean? I'll show you in a bit. But a lot of, I want to get to that in a few moments because Rose asks, Rose Phoenix asks a killer great question. Firefox FTP. A lot of web browsers now, uh, and this was written in July 20th of 2021. I'll read this out. A lot of uh, places, including web browsers, are phasing out FTP support for good reasons. The file transfer protocol has long been a convenient file exchange mechanism between computers on a network. While the standard protocol has been supported in all major browsers, and almost since its inception, it is one of the oldest protocols still in use and suffers from a number of serious security issues. The biggest security risk is that FTP transfer, here it is, FTP transfer data in clear text allowing attacker to steal, spoof, or even modify the data transmitted. To date, many malware distribution campaigns launched their attack by compromising FTP servers and downloading malware on an end user's device using the FTP protocol. There you go. Aligned with our intent to de-deprecate non-secure non HTTP and yada yada yada, and increase the percentage of secure communications uh, con connections, we, as long as many, as well as many other major web browsers, decided to discontinue support of the FTP protocol. Fail. Okay. Now let's go back. Now let's just click on any packet. Uh, click on the third one. Do a follow TCP stream. Okay. Here. The first thing that should be very glaring is you see a transaction log. This is the FTP data. This is FTP, not FTP data. This, all this log is considered to be FTP. You notice something very glaring with this FTP, with this TCP stream, with this one, with the very first thing that you see. You see a username and you see a password. That's not good. Yeah, Hungry Jack, yikes, yikes indeed. But you also see a JPEG got transmitted, transferred, a JPEG got transferred, 
a text file got transferred, another JPEG, and another JPEG. Yeah, it's a log similar to a receipt after purchase. Oh, you got it. Oh, yes, it is. You notice a quit and goodbye at the end. Oh, yes. So this is the entire transaction. This also includes your username and password as well, too, in plain text. Oh, yes. So Rose Phoenix, what is FTP data? The FTP data in this case will be the piece of the JPEG here, the piece of the JPEG here, the text file here, the JPEG here, and another JPEG. Oh, yeah. So Maya Snyder, oh yeah, this log is uh, has every, all the transaction between uh, uh, or that everything that in this case user Woodworm and with a password Baby Shark actually that that that's that's the username and password of the uh, FTP server for that press for that person. Well, wait a minute, let's go to stream. Is there another stream above? Oh yeah, here it is. Stream number one. Ooh, interesting. I see a JFIF and I see a two uh, copyright 2007 Apple. This is gobbledygook characters. But does anyone want to know what, what you think this is? Does anyone, yeah, there's RGB. What do you think this is? What do you think all this data is? 16 kilobytes. Take a guess. RGB, Apple. Wow. Anyone? Yeah, Mystery Fire. It's an image. It's an image, all right. Let's go to stream number two. Let's click it up. Oh, another JFIF. We got another image invite, Ramza. Yeah, Ramza. Yeah, we have another one. But remember, if you go back to stream number zero, you see, remember there was a text file as well, too? No, oh, there should be a text file here. JFIF. Stream number two is a JFIF. You would hope, oh, you see Photoshop in this one, too. But you also, the next one, go back to stream, go to stream three. Here's your text file. Cybersecurity and real politics. This is uh, Dan Gear's keynote at the Black Hat Security Conference in 2014, August 6th of 2014. Oh, yeah. A huge text file. Go up and down the stream means these are the different... Okay, so how many files were transmitted? And not including this one. One JPEG, another JPEG, another text file, another JPEG. As Maya asked, yeah, this is a receipt. You have five files that got transmitted here to the FTP server. Two JPEG, four JPEGs, sorry, and one text file. The stream... There's six total streams, including number zero, are the individual files that got transmitted to the FTP. So think of a stream as the piece of data that also got sent as well, too, that is part of this conversation. So this conversation is a complete FTP transaction. Stream number zero is going to be the receipt. But then the subsequent streams, one, two, three, four, five, are the different are the JPEG and the text files. The different pieces, the different files that got sent to the server. So now let's have some fun. I'm gonna minimize the windows, but notice that <clears throat> my desktop is empty. Clean. So now Let's actually reconstruct the pictures that were sent to the FTP server. Let's actually rebuild all, all the files that were sent. What you do is this. Uh, which packets have the file? Or they spread out? Yeah, yeah, that's, a good, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting question. They're all spread out. Actually, you can tell exactly which. Hold on. Hold on. Which packets have the file? And this is Rose Phoenix's question, the one that actually have the FTP dash data. So basically, uh, mini PTH, which packets have the file? The ones that have P, uh, uh, FTP dash data. So you take a look, FTP dot data, this one, this one, this one, this one all make up the first picture. Uh, this one actually, yeah, this one, that it? No. 
So they're all spread out. But you can tell by the uh, info column. So the first picture is made up of like quite a few, probably like eight uh, packets, the ones that have FTP data. Yeah, so they're spread out over multiple. So you can see this 1B yada yada dot JPEG has like, I don't know, I'm not losing count, but yeah, quite a few, over like a dozen packets, oh yeah. So you can, can you create code to transform a, a byte to RGB? So can you create code to transform images from bytes to RGB? Oh yeah. How does it determine how many bytes each packet is? How does it determine how many bytes each packet is? Um, good question. How, how does it determine how, how many bytes each packet is? There is a maximum per packet. You can't throw like an you can't throw the, an entire image. Um, you can't throw an entire image uh, into one single packet. So it is spread out over quite a few. Uh, 1460, look, look, this is 1460 bytes. Take a look. 1460 bytes. Another 1460 bytes. Another 1460 bytes. Another 1460 bytes. Another 1460 bytes. Why is this 2,352 bytes? I don't know. Another 1460 bytes, another 1460 bytes, another 1460 bytes, another 1460 bytes. Uh, I guess it's for this image. Yeah, but it's like 1460. I see 1460 quite consistently as well, too. Uh, I have to look that up. It's a good question. So how can we find out how many files have been sent over to the server? Yeah, again, that's, if you were paying attention, this was in the transaction log. Uh, 1460 I see quite often. So how can we find out how many files were sent to the server? Yeah, just count the, uh, just count the JPEG and the text and the PD, uh, PNGs here. So now let's actually reconstruct them. Go to stream number one, disperse JFIF. So, let's go to show data as, now remember, you don't want to save this onto your machine as ASCII text. You want to save this as binary. So, what you want to do is show the data as binary, which is raw. Now, you can do a save as. I'm going to save this to my desktop. Save it to the desktop as output one. Okay. So now I'm going to show the data to ASCII again. I'm just going to go to stream number two, the second file. Another JFIF, show the data as raw. Save as. Output two. Oh, Sluggo. Uh, it's going to be hard. If you can save, if you save it as ASCII, can you convert to binary later? You can, but like, it's ugly. Stream number three, this is a text file. You can just do a save as output three. Output four, yeah, here it is, it's JFIF, save it as raw. Now, just for you, just for you, um, Slago, I'm going to save uh, stream number five as ASCII, not binary. There is a way to transfer from binary to ASCII, ASCII to binary, but like, what's the point? Let me look something up for a second. Converting a file from ASCII to binary. Oh, here we go. You can do like XXD, but this is like kind of a pain in the ass. Okay. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. I'll just leave this up. But 
So here I am, I've output one, output two, output three, output four, output five, but notice something very important. I did not put a file extension for each and every output. And there's a reason for that. Remember in lab number one, the file command determines the file type. So if I do file output one, JPEG data. Well, this is an end. no file, no file extension. File output one, you can see it's, in the, it's a JPEG image data. This is why file extensions are important. So you can get like a preview icon or something. So I'm going to rename output one to output one.jpg because we now know that for sure that output one is a JPEG file. File output two. File output three. Output three is ASCII text. Really? Yeah. There you go. I'm just going to delete that. File output four. One more. File. ASCII text with very long lines. Okay, so, you know what? Why did I just do that? Ugh. Put the windows on this stupid thing. Ah, here we go. I'm going to rewrite that. Yeah. Does the images have some kind of... Yeah, that's a great question. So, Ramza. Yeah, there is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hold on, hold on. There is, there is, there is, there is, there is. There is. File put five. There is. Now the answer to that question a bit. So here are the pictures that are in set2.pcap. One, two, three, four, five, four. Those are your four pictures in set2.pcap. So to answer your question, Ramzi, uh, does the images have some kind of flag inside of it? Yes, absolutely. They're called a header. They're called image headers. And in fact, you've seen them. JFIF. So Ramza is JFIF. All right. We have. Hold on. We got our first spammer in a while. Is that what this is called? Ban. Okay, JFIF. Yep. JFIF is JPEG. JFIF header, yeah, the JPEG file interchange, and yeah. There it is. So, the answer to your question in short, yes. JPEG header. Yeah, I'm not going to read it. But yes, the answer to your question is, um, Ramza, yeah, the, the, there is. How to write a JFIF? Maybe this would help. Yeah, they have. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah, the header in this case, how to write a JFIF file. So, underneath the hood, a picture Every picture, whether it's a JPEG, a GIF, or a PNG, will have a, what they call an image header. Certain bytes. 
And the ones that for JPEG is one that looks for JFIF. Oh, yeah. Okay. Command line tools. You've already done this before. Uh, I already mentioned this command line tools. This was actually number, well, episode number one. On Twitch, we use uh, strings. Uh, we use file. You've done more. But let's do one. Another reconstructing a media file. But this one gets interesting. Let's reconstruct a media file. Set read up PCAP. Question number one is what protocol was used to transfer the file? What's the IP address of the client and the server? What's the port number of the server on the media server? And well, reconstruct the file. Now this one gets really interesting because this one is a little bit bigger. So you got a boot camp, you got a set read up PCAP. Copy the link. Now, this time, I'm going to create a filter. Now, let's reconstruct the media file in set3.pcap. Set3.pcap is 38.6 megabytes. Huge. How many packets? Whoa. Hold on. Let me just. What the heck? Desktop is empty. Uh, how many packets are here? Thirty-eight thousand four hundred sixty-nine. A lot of packets. But take a look at the TCP delivery handshake. One ninety-two dot one sixty-eight dot one dot two twenty-eight is sending to a server at one ninety-two dot one sixty-eight dot one dot twenty at port seven 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 again. All right, let's reconstruct the file. Construct a media file. Right-click, follow any packet, follow TCP stream. But here's the caveat. Notice that the packet count is still going. Don't touch a damn thing until the counter stops at the bottom right corner. You say 21, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. The entire conversation, 37 megabytes. Okay. Let's do this. Save it as raw. Transfer, okay, show the data as raw. Again, don't do a damn thing until the number of packets has stopped. Still going. Because if you try to do a save as now, which you can, you're not going to get the incomplete file. So you got to wait until the client packet counter stops. Done. Now do a save as, save to a desktop and call this thing called media. There it is. We have a media here. Some media file, some document, 37.3 megabytes. So what is this damn thing? Here we are, so I'm going to do a file media. It's an Apple QuickTime movie. Interesting. Alright, so I'm going to move media to media.mov. And what you're going to get? No oh, thanks. Uh, open. Oh, yeah, I was going to start. It's a fun time. I was falling in love. Now I'm only falling apart. Yeah, so let's do that one again. So, if you're wondering where that video is from, it was from Las Vegas at the Paris Hotel in 2019. Before all that shit happened in 2020, let's not speak of it. So when I was building this presentation out in 2020, 2021, I used that video because it was such a fun time. The context is uh, I crashed a friend's party. And then we stayed at the, we were at the party was at the uh, Dancing Piano Bar at Paris. And uh, then I called two of my friends 
to uh, show up and to hang out. I want to give a shout out to Josh Abraham and Peter Keenan. All three of us had a fun time. It was fun. But, hey, back then I was drinking as well, too. And uh, I remember the last couple of years, except for to, like 2020 and 2021, I was like reminiscing. It's like, gee, I was wondering, I'm wondering if I'll ever go back to Las Vegas again, uh, go back to DEF CON. And I uh, went back last year in 2022, went back in 2023, like this, this past summer. And I'm sad to say that the Dancing Piano Bar is no longer at the Paris Hotel. Nonetheless, uh, regardless, fun memories, fun times. Yeah, fun times. All right, we're almost done. We'll do one. Oh dear, I hate that. I hate to do this. So let's do. All right. So remember earlier when I showed out uh, when I showed the uh, packets on the command line, it was binary. So now let's talk about credentials, how credentials are stored incorrectly and how to get on the wall of sheep or not. There is a way to translate binary data to ASCII for safety purposes. Because remember, if you try to display binary data on a terminal, you hear a beep, 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 and all these other weird things happen. This is where Base64 happened. That can be useful. Base64 is an encoding scheme. I repeat everyone, Base64 is an encoding scheme. Not encryption, not encryption. Why is this important is, unfortunately, the people who built basic HTTP authentication, I'll show you a picture of what basic HTTP authentication looks like. You've all seen it before. is when you see a little gray box with the, to enter in your username, but yes, this. You see, yeah, you've all seen this before. This is behind the scene, if you're using HTTP, it's basic authentication. Username and password, like that. This is, basic, this is an example of uh, basic HTTP authentication uh, window. The problem is, is under the hood, nothing is encrypted. In basic HTTP authentication, which is, you know, that little gray box entry username password, um, a request containing a header field uh, authorization colon space basic is where the credentials of the base64 encoding of the ID and password is. So the base64 encoding is just a username followed by a colon followed by a password. I kid you not. So one of the websites I like to use is base64 and code. Go to base64encode.org. And this is where you can go encode and decode. So I'm gonna encode a message and I'm gonna say hungry jack one zero one is stoked. That's it. So this is the plain text, and I'm going to encode this into base64. And you can see the encoded string. You can do a base, you can go the other way around and decode, and you got Hungry Jack is stoked. And let's do another encoding example and just say, hello, all you happy people, and you do an encode, but you see an equal sign at the end of it. Here's the encoded string. One recognition activity is when you see a ASCII string that ends with an equal or an equal equal sign, that should tell you it probably is a base64 string, encoded string. What's the point of the equal or the double equal at the end of a string, a base64, uh, an ASCII string? Padding. I think I have a Oh. There's a good explanation on this on Stack Overflow. No, not this one. What is all the, in, what is all, yeah, this one. What is, um, uh, yeah, I'm going to show you that most of the base64 encoding has an equal, equal at the end. 
Yeah, base 64 string that will, will end with an equal equal sign if and only if the number of bytes, yada yada yada, you see the pattern. Yeah, base 64 is not encryption. But the equal and equal equal sign at the end of an ASCII string is padding. That's all you need to know. But why do you need to know this is this point right here. You want to do a search for authorization colon space basic. And then you see a base 64 encoded string as the credential. That will be where the username and password will be. Let's play Wall of Sheep. Exercise number four, extracting username and password pairs. Open up set 4.pcap. It's a really small set. Almost done. Set 4.pcap. Copy link. Let's open this up. 16, uh, 17 kilobytes. Really, really small PCAP set. You're going to find username and passwords in here, right? We will. But are they correct? That's another problem. So we're going to find username and passwords here by way of base64 encoding. But we're also going to verify if they're right or wrong. Let's find the pack. Let's actually do, uh, I'll just click the magnifying glass for the find. Packet details, narrow and wide. Yep, we're going to look for the string. So you want to make sure that you want to search for packet details, narrow and wide, and string. Not regular expression, string. Authorization, colon, space, basic. Let's find if there's any, uh, if we, uh, if there's PCAP of any of this. Ready? See if any packet has a string authorization colon basic. And ooh, we found one. We found one. Here we go. Authorization colon basic. And, and then here is a string. So what I'm going to do is right click on this. Copy. Copy as printable text. So remember the website that I had? Uh, base64 decode. There it is. I paste it here. So now... I don't want to decode the authorization colon space basic, whatever. Y and all this. And I'm going to decode it. Username is B Rogers colon. The password is they played with great character. So we got our first credential. Okay. Let's find another authorization colon space basic. Ooh, found another one. ZG1. Copy of printable text. D. Moyes colon, I am a football genius. Second credential. Find another one. We did. Here it is, a third copy of printable text. Third credential. A. Ausler colon as a username, ID 10T expert. Third credential found. And that's it, we're done. But here's a thing I want to let you know. You don't need to go to another website like base64decode.org to catch your username and password. Wireshark actually does the base64 decoding for you. You see where it says authorization colon basic? You can just expand and you see credential. B. Rogers, they played with great character. Do it again. D. Moyes, I'm a football genius. Do it again. A. Ausler, ID 10T expert. Even better, if you just want to actually, if you have a PCAP file and you want to see all the username and password that was sent in plain text, uh, all you need to do is to go to Tools, go to Credentials. Cheating. This is legal cheating. So you can see the protocol that was used, the username, not the password, and the packet number that the username and password the credentials are in. Yeah. So packet number 60 had B. Rogers. Packet number 138 had D. Moyes. Back in 163 is A. Ausler. Yeah, so we found three credentials, but are they going to the wall of sheep? They're very important. Do not go to the website or domain and enter the username and password to determine if it's valid or not.
do not do that because that's unauthorized access under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So wait a minute, if you found a username and password, how do you actually check if it was a legitimate username and password or not? Well, use what you learned. Right click, follow TCP stream or HTTP stream. And then, oh, this is not good. 401 authorization required. The server could not verify that you are authorized to enter. Either you supplied the wrong credentials, bad password, or your browser does not. Yeah, that's not good. Not good. So we got to the Ann Ausler one is bad. Let's check the B. Rogers one. Is this good too? Is this bad too? Follow HTTP stream. Yep. 401 as well. Not good. No, not good. Not good. Another one. Let's go to the D. Moyes one. Is this a D. Moyes one? Yep. Follow HTTP stream. Fail. We found three credentials, but all returned to 401. Bad password. Unfortunately, none of these credentials are going to the wall of sheep. Nope. Nope. Is that in the header in the body of the packet? That is in the HTTP header? Uh, that is in the HTTP header, which is the payload in a packet. Yeah. So if you can take a look, whoa, whoa, one more to answer your question. So if you take a look, uh, let me just do a right click follow TCP stream. Uh, I just had it. Follow HTTP stream. You can see the authorized. This is in the HTTP header right there. So this is the HTTP header. Yeah. So we just found three credentials. We Follow TCP stream, none of them were good. And that's it, folks. So where do you go from here? Well, you can sniff and validate password, do exercises. There are many, many more PCAP opportunities. GitHub has a good collection of PCAPs that you can always play around with. A lot of cybersecurity websites will always provide PCAPs. You can always volunteer at the Packet Hacking Village in the Wall of Sheep. You can learn more about Packet Inspector and Packet uh, Wireshark at our Packet Inspector event. And we also have a black badge contest where you win a lifetime admission to DEF CON. And that, folks, is all I have. Yep, there's also a command line version of Wireshark called T-Shark. If you don't like, if you want to actually do things really simply, just use T-Shark. Like, for example, you want to get a list of all the host and IP address and domain in a PCAP file, just use one nice command line. Yeah. How do we actually generate PCAP from our... For, how do you get from, uh, okay, so how do you actually generate PCAPs? Well, I'm all gone. Hold on. I'm going to quit this. I'm going to quit. So just for you ballot times, I'm going to quit all of I'm going to quit out of this. One way is, but it's funny, is because I'm going to talk about how you generate PCAPs. Are you ready? Let's go to your favorite website. Let's go to Reddit. So you can just hit, okay, so here's what you do to record a PCAP. Capture PCAP, go to, click on the blue fin and Wireshark. Oh, wait. So you can do that. So it's now just recording this entire Twitch stream. But the one thing that you really want to do is you got to go to Wireshark, go to Capture. Go to Options. Uh, I, my network adapter is EN4, so it makes that, and I just hit start. And I continue without saving. And then you just go browse the web, such as, like, go to HTTP, colon, slash, that, reddit.com. And then you can stop the recording that way. Yeah, and so this PCAP file should have the, should have Reddit. There it is. Got the uh, is on UDP and uh, yeah, reddit.com, type A. That's all I got. Yeah. All right, folks. We're a little bit over time. Thanks for joining, everyone. Yeah. Quit without saving. Take care, everyone. You folks have a great weekend. See you next week, and we'll talk about recon. <laughs>